Um, I'd like to. I'd like to introduce um, Michelle Nall, our speaker this morning for the first session, along with her co-authors, Heidi Bunk and Amy Kretlow. All three work for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, where Michelle is a statewide lake and reservoir ecologist, Heidi is a lakes biologist, and Amy is aquatic invasive species response and pathways specialist. Together, they will be speaking on the topic of monitoring and managing of starry stonework. Nitalopsis obtusa in Wisconsin lakes. They'll have about 30 minutes for their presentation and will then address questions. So please, um, if you have questions for them, type them into the Q&A section, not the chat, but the Q&A section and upvote the questions that you want answered. Um, we also um, ask that if you have a question for a specific speaker today, be sure to put that in your question. This is a question for Michelle, for example. And with that, I'm going to hand the virtual microphone over to Michelle. All right, thank you very much, Joe. Um, and thanks everyone for tuning in this morning on the second full day of Wisconsin Water Week. Um, I just want to acknowledge my co-authors one more time, Heidi Bunk and Amy Kretlow, uh, both work in the southeast part of the state for the Wisconsin DNR. And they were um, very integral in a lot of the data and information that you're going to see in this presentation today. Hey guys, I'm going to jump in because the live stream is not coming through. So I think the credentials for live streaming might be incorrect. Um, Bill, you'd have to change those in the more tab. I'm still not seeing any live stream on the other computer. It's, so in your controls on the more uh, down by the mute and record and reactions and all that stuff, there should be three dots and you can choose the live streaming credentials. And those are posted within that session spreadsheet. Um, I'll pull them up here in a sec. Uh, hmm, it's saying it's live streaming. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's just streaming to the wrong place. <laughs> So instead of going to the correct session, I think it's going somewhere else. If you want, I can put, I can post those in the chat and you can take them one, one at a time and put them into the live stream fields. Okay. And then we'll just redo it. Sarah, were you seeing any streaming coming through? Nope. Okay. So the first one is probably correct. It's the second and the third field that you'll need to redo. So put this in the second field, if you see that in the chat. And, and I'll put the third one in. That one would be copied and pasted into the third live streaming field. If you, if you, are you able to get to those? Yep. And then save those again. And then let's see if, if you can start live streaming and we'll see if it goes to the right place. Here it comes. All right, we're looking good now. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's session on aquatic invasive species. Uh, this session is being recorded. Um, my name is Joe Lattimore. I'm from Michigan State University and excited to be part of Wisconsin Water Week. Our first speaker this morning will be Michelle Nall from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Um, she's joined by her co-authors, Heidi Bunk and Amy Kretlow. All three are at the Wisconsin DNR, and they will be presenting on the topic of monitoring and management of starry stonewort in Wisconsin lakes. They'll have about 30 minutes for their presentation, and while they're speaking, feel free to post any questions for them in the Q&A box, not the chat box, the Q&A box, um, and indicate who the question is for. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to Michelle. All right, 
Thanks, Joe. Um, I appreciate everyone um, hanging in there as we dealt with a quick technical difficulty. Um, so yes, I'm Michelle Nault. I'm the statewide lakes and reservoir ecologist for the Wisconsin DNR. And I want to acknowledge, um, again, my two co-authors, Heidi Bunk and Amy Kretlow, also DNR employees that work in the southeast part of the state. Um, and we're very integral in getting a lot of the data and information that I'm going to present to you guys today. So just a little bit of background on what starry stonewort is. Um, starry stonewort is a macroalgae species. So it's a little bit different than many of our true vascular plants. It's originally native to Europe and Asia, and it's actually quite rare in portions of its native range. However, it was first documented in the United States in the 1970s, and it was likely inadvertently introduced to the US via international ballast water with it first appearing in the St. Lawrence River. It's able to survive a wide range of habitats and it primarily reproduces via these unique asexual bulbils that you can see in the bottom right corner. The ecological impacts of the species are largely unknown. And so much of what we're trying to do is to better understand what impacts this new invader might have on our Wisconsin lakes. A couple of quick identification tips before we get moving here. Um, on the left, there's a picture of starry stonewort. And then on the right are three pictures of native lookalike species. And so compared to some of our native Caras and Nutellas, starry stonewort is, is much larger and more robust. The whirls of the leaves are, are a lot longer than with our native uh, Cara and Nutella species. And perhaps the most unique distinguishing characteristic of starry stonewort is the star-shaped bulbils that it produces. And this is how it primarily reproduces. So on the left, you'll see a, a photo of a plant that was dislodged from the ground. And those tiny white dots are magnified on the right. And you'll see a, a very distinct star-shaped bulbul, which is a key identifying characteristic of this new aquatic invasive plant. In terms of rage inspection, it's been found throughout the northeastern part of the US, as well as parts of the, new, of the Midwest, um, primarily found in Michigan with several um, about you know several hundred lakes now having starry stonework confirmed in the state. More recently, it was found in Wisconsin in 2015 and followed by Michigan soon after, or excuse me, Wisconsin in 2014 and followed by Michigan soon after in 2015. And it's currently known from several Midwest states as well as parts of Canada. And the number of reported starry stonewort populations has um, significantly increased over time and particularly in the last decade or so. This is a graph that was taken from a recent article published in Aquatic Bot Botany by Dan Larkin. And you'll see that um, from the initial detection in the 1970s up until the mid 2000s, really there weren't very many populations of starry stonewort that were detected and reported. However, in the last decade or so, we can see that the, both the number of confirmed populations, which have been verified via a taxonomic expert, and the number of total reported populations have significantly increased. And so for Wisconsin, our first discovery of starry stonewort occurred back in September of 2014, when some of our staff were out conducting a relatively routine aquatic plant point intercept survey out on Little Muskego Lake in Waukesha County. Uh, this uh, population was suspected to be starry stonewort at the time of discovery, but it was also verified by other DNR staff as well as experts from the New York Botanical Garden, seeing that this was the first population of starry stonewort found in our state. This detection triggered a rapid assessment monitoring, which occurred in lakes surrounding the initial detection in southeast Wisconsin. And this monitoring consisted of a variety of different methods, including rake tosses at boat launches, shoreline meander surveys, underwater snorkeling, as well as full lake-wide aquatic invasive species early detection surveys. There were some efforts made to try to prioritize serving lakes that had appropriate characteristics for starry stonework growth. Um, and primarily this was the presence of other native Kara species as well as water hardness. We also have a very robust aquatic invasive species statewide program in Wisconsin. And so this new discovery really raised some heightened outreach and awareness about this new species. And so when staff in other areas of the state were out doing their aquatic invasive species surveys and also their aquatic plant point intercept surveys, 
they were very aware that this new species had been found and they were um, on the lookout for it. And so that leads us to date. Um, since the initial finding in 2014, we are currently up to 14 inland water bodies in Wisconsin where starry stonewort has been verified. The starry stonewort has also been verified along coastal portions of both Green Bay and Lake Michigan. Um, our most recent efforts in 2020, uh, despite the challenges that COVID uh, threw at us, um, DNR staff and some partners were able to go out and, and uh, implement a pretty significant effort for monitoring starry stonewort, primarily in the central part of the state to follow up on some newer discoveries in the last two years that are a little bit disjunct from some other populations that had previously been more restricted to the southeast part of the state. And so in these 14 water bodies where we have Sarah St Stonewort verified, we've been conducting standardized lakewide aquatic plant surveys in order to collect data on an annual basis. So we can really start to just better understand the impacts of this species on our aquatic plant communities. And so this standard method allows for us to collect some really robust data, which lets us look at a plant community change within a lake over time, and also lets us look at uh, changes amongst different lakes that might have starry stonewort present. The PI method is relatively easy to implement and it provides some really great statistically robust data that's also geolocated. So it also helps you make um, maps to help target your management act actions and activities. And as I mentioned, um, we not only collect uh, data on starry stonework presence, but also on all the other native plants which are part of the uh, plant community. And so here's an example of a starry stonewort uh, um, map that was created based upon a point intercept survey. So on the left is the basic point intercept grid for Little Muskego Lake. And then on the right is the distribution of starry stonewort um, after the first year that we surveyed the water body. And you'll see that these red stars in this one bay indicate that originally the starry stonewort was very localized out on this water body. And that really helped us to target our management actions in the specific uh, area of the lake. And so, as I mentioned, we've been collecting this lake wide point intercept data on all the water bodies with starry stonewort. And so this graph displays the data that we've collected to date. On the bottom, we have the year starting in 2014 and going up to our most recent surveys in 2020. And then on the vertical axis, we have the littoral frequency of occurrence of starry stonewort. So this is a metric that basically tells you how abundant starry stonewort is in the area of a lake where plants are able to grow. And you'll notice that um, we have some different patterns in starry stonewort frequency observed over time across these different water bodies. We have some lakes, um, for example, like Little Muskego and Long Lake, where the trend in starry stonewort over time has been increasing with more abundant starry stonewort observed as the years progress. However, we also have lakes such as Pike Lake where the amount of starry stonewort has actually been decreasing over time. And then we have other patterns in uh, lakes like silver and green and little cedar, where the starry stonewort has remained relatively stable over time and hasn't really increased or decreased. And so the department continues to um, collaborate with partners so that we can um, continue to collect this very important data on these trends over time in these water bodies to better understand potential impacts. Another thing the point intercept data allows us to do is to look at where starry stonewort occurs in lakes by water depth. And so this graph looks at varying water depths on the bottom on the X axis and then the number of unique sites where starry stonewort was found on the vertical Y axis. And you'll notice that most of the starry stonewort that we found in our invaded lakes are found in relatively shallow waters, primarily between two to six feet deep. Although starry stonewort is able to grow out at deeper depths with our deeper, uh, deepest depth to date being found out at 28 feet. But primarily it does like to colonize more in those shallower near shore areas. Another thing that we've just started to explore is what the potential impacts of starry stonewort might be on some of our beneficial native aquatic plants. And so this is a graph that looks at the number of average native species found at each individual survey site 
over time for the lakes where we had at least three years worth of data. And similar to what we saw in the trends in starry stonewort frequency, we also see some differences in the potential impacts on native plants. We have some lakes where the overall trend illustrated by the dashed blue line is decreasing over time, suggesting that starry stonewort and other invasive species may be having a negative impact. However, we also have lakes that are exhibiting either no change in um, the overall trend in average number of native species, or even increasing trends in the average number of natives. And again, we'll continue to collect some data and expand upon this to better understand what impacts uh, starry stonewort might have on our native species. And then finally, for the second half of this presentation, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on some of the specific implementation efforts that we've done to try to control starry stonewort. Um, the department ever since starry stonewort was first found in 2014 has uh, worked with partners in an attempt to try a variety of different techniques um, on, on trying to control starry stonewort. Um, there really wasn't much in the published literature or from talking with other resource managers on things that had actually been proven to be effective for starry stonewort. And so some of the techniques that we've tried to date include uh, chemical treatments, both in open water scenarios, as well as utilizing limno barrier curtains. We've also utilized a winter drawdown, diver assisted suction harvesting and hand removal, we have at least one lake that has implemented dash, or excuse me, dredging, and then also um, no management, no active management, but just monitoring the population over time. And so this is the same frequency of occurrence graph that I showed for starry stonewort uh, a couple minutes ago, but now I've overlaid all the various management techniques that have been implemented for starry stonewort control over the past couple of years. So the red dashed lines indicate herbicide treatments, which have occurred in an attempt to control starry stonewort, primarily based with copper and endothole products. But we've also have some lakes that have utilized dash and hand pulling indicated by the bluer lines, drawdown indicated by the green line, as well as dredging. And so primarily most of our management to date has been focused on using chemical herbicides, but um, more integrated techniques are being used on some water bodies as well. And so what I would like to do is just highlight uh, two of these case studies in a little bit more detail. Um, I, I don't have time to get into all the individual uh, nitty gritty details for all the lakes, um, but I will mention that we do have a starry stonewort fact sheet available on our DNR website that um, you can reference that has some of those figures and graphs that I presented earlier, if you'd like a little bit more detail. And so the two case studies I'd like to highlight um, with the rest of my time this morning are Green Lake in Washington County, as well as Okachi Lake in Waukesha County. And both of these uh, Starry Stonewart projects utilized a relatively small scale treatment um, that used a chemical combination that was applied within a physical limno barrier curtain to try to hold that herbicide on site and allow for sufficient contact exposure time to hopefully actually kill starry stonewort and achieve our management goals. And so Green Lake is a 70 acre seepage lake. Um, it's about 40 feet max depth and starry stonewort was first found in 2016 at a relatively localized area near one of the two public boat access locations on the water body. This lake happens to fall within the Great Lakes Basin. And so they were able to work um, with partners and DNR staff to uh, obtain funding through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative to help support some of the monitoring and control efforts that were implemented out here. And again, specifically, this was a herbicide treatment which was applied um, in about a one acre area. Um, you can see some aerial photos here of the boat launch and then the barrier schematics, as well as the barrier curtain being um, placed out on the water body. There was two treatments that occurred. The first one happened in September of 2018, and then the follow-up treatment happened in June of 2019. And the chemical combination utilized was a mixture of Qtrine Ultra, which is a copper product, and Hydrothal 191. 
the way that we monitored uh, these projects was that we um, had a, a point intercept grid developed specifically for the area that we were targeting for treatment. And we also monitored water samples after treatment in order to uh, determine how much herbicide product was remaining in the water column um, following treatment to help us better understand the efficacy data that we collected. And then we collected the pre and post plant surveys, um, both prior to treatment and immediately after treatment in both uh, 2018 and 2019, as well as in 2020. So first I'll talk about the herbicide concentration results for Green Lake. Um, both of these figures are looking at the 2018 and then the 2019 results for copper. On the bottom axis, we have the number of days after treatment and then on the vertical y-axis, we have the concentration of copper, which was observed. The red horizontal line indicates the target rate, what the applicators were aiming to achieve with this treatment. And then the various lines indicate the monitoring stations, both within the barrier and then also outside the barrier. And so what we'll see from this data is that in both years, the herbicide was able to hit the target concentration and out um, for several days after treatment, the herbicide concentration was maintained, ultimately until the barrier was removed. Um, the sites outside of the barrier um, at the bottom here did not exhibit much herbicide um, leakage. And so the barrier uh, did its job basically of keeping that herbicide where we wanted it to be, allowing for the plants to be exposed to that herbicide for as long as possible. Um, these are very similar graphs, um, but these are the results for endothol instead of copper. Again, good uh, hitting of the target rate and not very uh, much herbicide seen outside of the barrier curtain. And so how did this translate into our efficacy for starry stonewort? Um, these are two graphs for 2018 and 2019. The blue line indicates the percent of starry stonewort frequency. So this is the presence absence data. Um, and that uh, axis is over here. And then the green bars indicate the average rake fullness rating. This is a surrogate for how much biomass or how much plant material is physically there at the site. And um, those rake fullness ratings are given on a scale of zero to three um, with three being the most abundant. The red vertical lines indicate when the um, herbicide treatment occurred. And so we'll see in 2018, um, prior to treatment, starry stonewort frequency was about 21%. And following treatment, starry stone frequency was still at about 21%. So the treatment unfortunately did not uh, achieve our goal of reducing starry stonewort in that treatment area. And similar results were seen in 2019 where again, um, starry stonewort was relatively low when the treatment occurred, but by the last sampling event in August, it had uh, rebounded back to um, relatively high levels. And so finally, I'm gonna transition quickly into Okachi Lake so I can get a minute or two for questions. Um, Okachi Lake is a much larger lake um, with a similar scenario where starry stonewort was found near a, a localized boat access area. There was also a small population detected near a bridge on the lake. And so this allowed for a unique opportunity to manage one of the sites while simultaneously monitoring the other site as an untreated reference area. And this lake group worked with DNR to apply for some early detection and response grant funds to help support the monitoring and control efforts out here. Again, this was a chemical control application within a limno barrier. Um, this was about a half an acre treatment that happened in mid-July, and the chemical combination utilized was Nautique with Hydrothal-191. And the specific reason this chemical combination was utilized was based on some research that the U.S. Army Corps had indicated that this might be a, a good combination to try in order to not only kill the vegetative part of starry stonewort, but also to kill the underground bulbuls. Very similar to Green Lake, we did uh, both pre and post uh, surveys for aquatic plants, as well as collected the herbicide concentration monitoring within the barrier curtain and outside the curtain. And as I indicated, we did our plant monitoring both within the treated area and as well as in an untreated reference area. 
Very similar to what we saw out on Green Lake, our herbicide concentration monitoring indicated that we were able to hit the target concentrations that we were aiming for. Um, and the blue line at the bottom of both these graphs indicate the site outside the treatment area. And again, we saw very little herbicide leakage outside with that herbicide product staying where we wanted it to be. Michelle, you have about four minutes left. Great, thank you. Um, and so um, getting on to the plant data here, um, again, unfortunately, very similar results that we saw with Green Lake, even though we utilized a different chemical combination. Pre and post treatment, we did not see any significant change in starry stonewort frequency. Um, and when we look at our untreated reference lake, basically the same patterns that we saw in both frequency and in the biomass was observed in both the site we treated and the site we didn't treat. And so just to kind of wrap things up, um, our data to date indicates that, you know, the starry stoneware populations that we've been monitoring has showed a very wide range of invasion trajectories over time and really some mixed effects on native plant communities. And so we'll continue to collect and analyze this data in order to really increase our understanding of what the potential impacts of this new invasive species might actually be on Wisconsin lakes. Um, to date, some of our pre and post treatment data um, on these lakes that have primarily used chemical control methods really hasn't resulted in effective control. And so we're continuing to look at monitoring other non-chemical management techniques, potentially other chemical combinations in the future to try to figure out something that, that will work to hopefully control starry stonewort. And we're not doing this alone. Um, we're working with many other regional and national partners, um, the US Army Corps, University of Minnesota, University of Indiana. Um, we're also active members of the Great Lakes Starry Stonework Collaborative. And so hopefully we'll continue to evaluate techniques and work together to better understand how to manage the species in the future. And with that, I will have um, a couple minutes to take any questions that might be there. Uh, thanks again to all my um, partners and uh, here's our emails if you'd like to contact us. Thanks again. Thanks, Michelle. Um, we do have a couple minutes left for questions. Um, one that's come in, I'll read to you. Is there any idea of why Starry Stonewort in Pike Lake has declined with no management? I feel that if we could figure out the factors that are causing the decline, we could better understand how to manage it in other lakes. This could be an area of study. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, you know, Pike Lake is one that definitely is is very interesting to us, um, given that the starry stonework frequency has declined over time. Um, Pike Lake is actually a lake that does no active management at all for invasive species. Um, it has Eurasian water milfoil. It has zebra mussels. It clearly has starry, and so. Um, you know, perhaps just the disturbance of management might give Starry Stonewort an ability to, uh, you know, take off in some of these lakes where in other lakes that, you know, perhaps are not being actively managed, it's able to integrate into the community a little bit better. Um, but that'll be one we definitely continue to watch over time. Thanks, Michelle. And, and one more question. Um, what if a, a person thinks they've found Starry Stonewort in a Wisconsin lake? What should they do? Great. Uh, well, yeah, that's great that, you know, citizens are out there looking for this. Um, if you do think you found starry stonewort, the best route would be to contact your regional DNR aquatic invasive species coordinator. Um, all of those contact information can be found on our DNR website. Um, and so if you happen to find it in the southeast part of the state, um, Amy Kretlow would be your local contact there. Um, it's really great if you can collect a specimen of starry stonewort, so actually grab some and stick it in a Ziploc bag with a little bit of water. Um, pictures are always uh, welcome as well, but um, some of the characteristics we're looking for starry stonewort are, are pretty tiny. Um, this bulbul here is, is no bigger than the size of a fingernail, so, um, so that would be the best way, and then we can work with you to verify if it's starry stonewort or perhaps one of our native uh, Kara lookalike species. All right, thanks again, Michelle, and to your co-authors, Amy and Heidi, um, for sharing this work you're doing on starry stonewort. 
And with that, we're going to move on to our next set of presentations. So um, welcome everyone who has joined us. Um, we are moving on in our uh, coverage of aquatic invasive species this morning. And the next session is recognizing aquatic invasive animals and plants. Um, we will first hear from Paul Skowinski, who is a Wisconsin Citizen Lake Monitoring Network educator from Extension Lakes. Um, and Paul will be presenting on invasive submerged aquatic plants, who's who. And then right after that, we'll go into hearing from Peggy Compton, the program manager for Wis Water Action Volunteers, who will present Meet Wisconsin's Aquatic Invasive Animals. And then finally, we'll jo be joined by Ann Pierce, the Wisconsin First Detector Network Coordinator, who will share on what's that uplandish plant. Um, together, they'll have about 45 minutes for their presentations, and then we'll be able to answer your questions. So if you have questions for Paul, Peggy, or Anne, please post them into the Q&A box. Um, if you put them in the chat box, the, the presenters won't be able to see them. So put them into the Q&A box, and um, if you can, write the name of the speaker that you'd like the question to be posed to. Is it for Paul? Is it for Peggy? Is it for Anne? Um, and upvote any questions you see that you want to see answered. So with that, I'm going to hand the stage over to Paul. All right, thanks, Joe. My, my goal here with this presentation is to run through a small set of invasive submergent and floating aquatic plants, uh, a couple of which are fairly common in Wisconsin, and then a bunch of them that are not common by any means, but we have repeatedly found them here, and it seems like they may be just knocking on the door. Um, so I'm hoping that everybody watching will just get some mental images in their mind of these different plants. And if they do find them on the landscape at some point in the future, then you might think back to that, that presentation you saw at some point that uh, you saw a picture of this plant and maybe you should have it looked at by an expert for a verification of the, the ID of this species. So that's, that's what I'm hoping for today. The first one I'll talk about is Eurasian water milfoil. We've been talking about this one plenty. It's been around for about 60 years here in Wisconsin. It's found in at least 864 lakes and streams here. There's probably a few dozen more that are undocumented right now. We haven't just haven't found them yet. Um, it's a great example of why early detection is, is so important across all of these species. We really want to find these when they are causing the least amount of ecological damage and would cause uh, the, the least need for financial investment and uh, would be the easiest to control. So we like to find things as early as possible to make the management as easy as and effective as possible as well. Uh, this plant does sometimes sometimes form pretty dense mats on the surface of the water. It can interfere with all kinds of recreation in that case. It's, it's hard to boat through or fish in a, a mat like you see on the lower photo there. And it does spread by fragmentation. So any, any little piece that breaks off from a propeller or other turbulence in the water can start a new plant and uh, spread it around a lake or between lakes. So the milfoils as a group, we have eight of them in Wisconsin. One of them does not follow this rule, but the other seven have these very feathery leaves like this. The, all the common species that you're likely to see will have this kind of a, a leaf pattern to them. Typically four leaves around the stem in a, a whorl or a ring. And each leaf is divided very extensively into these tiny leaflets. And one of the ways to tell the species apart is by counting the number of leaflet pairs on an individual leaf. So if you counted those leaflets along the lower side of this leaf on your screen, I think you get 18, I believe is what I counted uh, yesterday. So it is clearly more than 12, and that's, that's sort of the magic number that we use. If it's more than 12, it's likely a Eurasian water milfoil species. If it is less than 12, then it's one of the native species. The most common native that we see is northern water milfoil, which you see pictured here on the left with Eurasian milfoil on the right. And you can see a few differences right away. One, the northern milfoil tends to be more singular stems, fairly green and slower growing. The Eurasian milfoil tends to be reddish on the top and branches more profusely near the surface and grows a little bit faster. You can see growing in the exact same spot here, the Eurasian is at the surface, it's producing flowers already, um, forming more of a bush in the water rather than individual stems. 
You can also see a difference in the leaves at the bottom of the screen. The northern milfoil tends to have six, seven, eight pairs of leaflets on an individual leaf. Eurasian milfoil usually having the 13 or more. Curly leaf pondweed is another common one. It's been here for over 100 years, probably introduced through multiple methods in the past, including when common carp were intentionally stocked into many Wisconsin water bodies as a sport fish and a food fish. Uh, this is a, an interesting species in that it grows in uh, a different season than what many of our aquatic plants do. It tends to grow from about late September through the end of June. So it is dormant through the summer instead of dormant through the winter like most plants. It doesn't like really warm water. So when the water warms to a certain uh, temperature in the summertime, the plant just decides I'm going to go dormant now, release some some vegetative buds to just lay at the bottom of the lake and then sprout up again in the fall. Um, occasionally you may see this plant year round. If it's in a cold trout stream or near a spring in a lake where the water is constantly cool, the plant can grow year round. So you may find it there uh, in the middle of summer. And it tends to release these nutrients into the water as the plant decomposes in the summer, if it dies back, it releases a lot of nutrients into the water at a a bad time uh, when you consider algae blooms as an issue. So these nutrients are released into the water. The water is very warm. The sun is intense. Algae are very active and they tend to grab onto those nutrients immediately when they see them. So uh, large algae blooms are a common side effect of having die-offs of curly leaf pondweed in the summertime. This species is one of about three dozen species of pondweeds we have here in Wisconsin, but only one of them, this one, has a serrated edge on the leaf. So it's a very useful indicator of which species it is. A lot of times you'll see the wavy leaf of curly leaf pondweed shown as a very important characteristic, and in, indeed it is. But if you find a very young plant, the, the leaves will not be very curly or wavy like the, the picture on the left. They will be flat like the picture on the right. But you can always use that serrated edge as an identifying feature for that species. A couple other pondweeds that are very commonly confused for curly leaf are these two on the screen here, clasping leaf and fern pondweed, both fairly common species that, that you probably have seen before. Starry stonewort, Michelle just talked extensively about this one. Uh, it is again a, a, a macro algae species. It can grow to six or seven or eight feet tall. So it is pretty big and it resembles a larger plant or a vascular plant. It does still have the same sort of body plan to it with a central stem and these leaves or what are called branchlets. It's, a, it's more of an algae taxonomy term, um, but you can think of them as leaves around the stem tends to be about three to four inches in diameter. So it's a fairly large plant. Um, and then it produces those ball bills that Michelle talked about before. These are just under the sediment surface, just an inch or two down. And they look like little stars. They're about a third of an inch long as, as a maximum size. And these produce clones of the starry stonewort plant later in the future. Some of our native species that look kind of similar are pretty much within this group, the, the Nitella group or slender stoneworts. Um, this one here you can see is a lot skinnier. Typically the Nitellas are maybe an inch to two inches in diameter, not the four that we saw in the starry stonewort, and they do not produce ball bills in the sediment. Brazilian waterweed is one that we've seen a, uh, only once, I believe, in Wisconsin, but it was a pretty common water garden and aquarium species for quite a while. It is now on the prohibited list, like many of these species now uh, in my presentation are. Um, this one is a, a pretty big, robust plant. It grows to about the diameter of a nickel to uh, several times that diameter. And the leaves tend to be in rings or whorls of four to eight and serrated on the edge, just like the curly leaf pondweed was. It looks very similar to common waterweed, and indeed we've had a few false reports of the Brazilian waterweed, which have ended up being this, and that's totally fine. Uh, this one tends to have leaves and whorls of three, and the leaves are not serrated on the outside. Plus, it tends to be less than the diameter of a nickel. This is a really, really common species across the, the state, the country, and the world. 
All right, water hyacinth and a couple of these other ones I'll be talking about after this one are these floating plants that form these clusters of leaves that float around on the surface. Water hyacinth has these swollen bases of each leaf where it is full of this very large uh, airy tissue. So it's very buoyant, it contains mostly air and it allows the plant to, to float at a very high level uh, at the surface. And then above that swollen part is this very waxy, shiny, dark green blade, which reminds me of the side of a pumpkin. When you, when you look at the shape of this leaf, it's sort of this broad oval shape. And that serves as sort of a sail for each individual plant. They catch the wind and eventually these clumps will actually break from wind or turbulence in the water. And then the, the currents or the wind just push a little clump here and a clump there and it helps them to disperse across the lake. It's a very, or was a very common water garden species because of the showy flowers that you see on the bottom of the screen there. And it produces these long roots underneath that can be several feet long and they allow the plant to take nutrients directly out of the water column rather than from the sediment. It looks a little bit like our wild calla lily species, but calla is rooted on the edge of the water and then typically sprawls out over the water just a couple feet from the shore. So it is not a floating species. And the flower is way different as you see in the picture here. It's just this little spike with a white hood around it compared to that very showy pollen, uh, insect pollinated flower on the water hyacinth. Water lettuce is a, another floating plant that forms clusters of leaves again, except that these ones are, the, the entire leaf is extremely airy and very, very light. You can hold up a whole clump of these things once they're dry anyway, and, and it hardly has any weight at all. So again, it helps it float very high on the water surface, helps it break up in the wind to be dispersed around the water body. And uh, this is another common water garden species. You can see the roots on the right, just like the water hyacinth, very fibrous, very long. They dangle into the water and take nutrients out of the water column. Yellow floating heart is one that we have found a few times in Wisconsin. This one looks like a tiny lily pad. Uh, it's only about three to four inches long produces a little yellow flower about the size of a quarter to a half dollar size. And that sticks a few inches above the water surface with five petals, uh, each petal being kind of fringed along the outside. And the leaves tend to be kind of scalloped around the outside. So they've got this wavy appearance along the outside of the leaf. This could be confused with water lilies or maybe water shield. Uh, water shield is a football shaped leaf that's usually quite slimy and has a pink flower. And then uh, of course our, our pond lilies typically are much bigger than this. There is one species that's similar in size to this, but it would not have the scalloped edge along the outside of the leaf and typically would be very sparsely growing. It's a rare species. You, you almost never see large populations of it. And um, the flower would be more cup shaped or ball shaped sitting right on the surface of the water. The last one I'll talk about is water chestnut. This one is not in Wisconsin, has not ever been found in Wisconsin yet, but it seems to be moving here from the eastern states. Uh, you can see the picture on the top there uh, is one I found in New York at uh, Oneida Lake almost 10 years ago now. You can see two big clumps of water chestnut in my hands there with these very long, uh, long stem dangling down into the water with submergent leaves and roots hanging off of it. The biggest issue with this one is maybe not the, the invasive tendencies compared to uh, uh, overtaking other plants and things like that, but the fruits that it produces are very, very hard and very strong and very sharp. You can see a close up of the, one of the spines that are barbed uh, on the outside of this fruit. And supposedly these things can puncture thin shoe soles. So like uh, flip flops you might be wearing on the beach, you could step on one of these and it may actually poke right through your sole. So it's a nasty plant, um, not one that we wanna have around here. So we wanna make sure that people would recognize it if we do ever see it show up here in Wisconsin. Uh, that is it for mine. And we're gonna move on to the next presentation now. Paul, while we're switching to the next presentation, um, a question that came up was, will the PowerPoints be available to the attendees from this session? 
I'm not sure if we're planning on sharing all the PowerPoints, but the recordings will be available. We'll be posting them all to our Extension Lakes YouTube channel within a few weeks, probably. I'd say the beginning of April is probably likely. We have a lot of presentations to get through uh, and archive all these. But uh, again, maybe the the PowerPoint slides themselves not available, but the recordings, which will show the PowerPoints as well, will be archived and available. Thank you. I think we can move on to Peggy now. All right. Well, hopefully you're seeing my slides and hearing me. Looks good. All right. Well, um, I'm going to follow in a similar pattern as what Paul got us started on, except we'll be looking at invasive species that are animals. Um, you'll see there we're going to start by looking at some small snails, move into a couple of larger snails and a native um, lookalike to those, move on to talking about some crayfish, mussels, clam, and then wrap up with the spiny water flea. First of all, with our snails, uh, the faucet snail, uh, well, first in general, when we talk about snails, one of the things that we're going to uh, talk about right towards the top of our discussions of um, identification is the opening or how the, um, if you hold the snail upright with the, the point up, um, where's the, the opening of the snail? Is it on the right side or the left side? So both the faucet snail and New Zealand mud snail are right side opening on the shells. And you can see that in the pictures there. Um, the next thing we're going to look at is the, the shape of the shell and the, the whorls or spirals. And you can see on the left side, the faucet snail uh, has five to six whorls, whereas the New Zealand mud snail has seven or eight. Um, the New Zealand mud snail, then looking at size, is a lot smaller. Uh, that's a, a definitely indication or, or distinction that we can make uh, where the faucet snails might be small up to a half an inch in um, length or height. Uh, these New Zealand mud snails are extremely small, an eighth inch to a quarter of an inch. And you can see there in the picture on the dime, um, all of those New Zealand mud snail on, on the dime, um, not much bigger than the, the nose of the, um, the person on the dime there. So very small. Um, the, the faucet snails can be light brown to black uh, versus the New Zealand mud snails more in the gray to brown. Uh, and the faucet snail, another part of any of the snails that we can talk about is the operculum, which is the covering of that opening. And the faucet snail, you can see distinct concentric rings like the, the rings um, on a tree. So you can see distinct uh, rings on that operculum or opening. A few other things. Uh, the faucet snail is a, a scraper and a filterer, meaning that they can graze on algae um, on the substrate, um, scraping that off and eating it, as well as using its gills to filter the suspended algae from the water column. So they can, um, in that way, you know, really um, take a lot of the, the food source for other things out of the water. Uh, they can survive in really high densities in nutrient-rich waters, um, especially those waters that might have runoff or human influence. So they can um, build up in large numbers very quickly. The New Zealand mud snail, um, a few more things about that. Also, it's a grazer that feeds on sediments and algae. Um, because of its small size, it can easily hitchhike on gear and equipment. Um, again, another snail, the, the New Zealand also has the operculum, which acts as a trapdoor, closing off that opening to the snail that allows it to survive for lengthy amounts of time in adverse conditions or out of the water. So that does affect um, how we, uh, are actions that we need to take to control the spread of the New Zealand mud snail. Um, we do not recommend wearing felt soled boots for any work in the water in our streams, but especially in waters with the New Zealand mud snail, um, felt soled boots are extremely hard to decontaminate. Um, remember this picture of the dime and how small the New Zealand mud snail are. So think about um, getting every speck of mud off your boots to make sure that is no um, New Zealand mud snail.
That was from samples that were collected in 2011 and 12. So that was our first find in Wisconsin. They are often in our very high quality cold water streams, which is a, a really big um, concern in terms of the New Zealand mud snail getting spread. Moving on to much larger snails are mystery snails. Um, the Chinese mystery snail has a smooth shell. It's larger than the banded mystery snail. Uh, the Chinese mystery snail up to three inches tall has deep grooves between the whorls, which you can see in the photo there. Um, the Chinese mystery snail was brought to California in the late 1800s. So unlike many of our other invasives that are um, relatively new to the United States, relatively being 20, 30, 40 years, um, Chinese mystery snail brought here in the late 18, 1800s, most likely as a food source, and then spread to the Eastern United States even by the early 1900s. Again, another snail that has an operculum, and you can see the um, there in the, the picture of the Chinese mystery snail, a little better view of that. The banded mystery snail, not as large, but still much bigger than the two snails that, um, that we were talking about on the previous page, one to one and a half inches tall, another right hand opening snail. And um, you can see from the picture, the bands, the, the horizontal brown bands on this snail makes it a very desirable um, aesthetic you know, snail for aquariums. And that's how it, is, it was probably spread was through illegal release, um, you know, bought to be in aquariums and then spread through illegal release. Um, the, uh, the snails, uh, the banded mystery snails are, uh, very voracious eaters. They can outcompete uh, our native snails for food and habitat, but they also spread disease and parasites to the wildlife that eat them. So another issue with having these um, invasives. So finally, what's the mystery behind mystery snails? They are said to, the females can mysteriously and abruptly give birth to live fully developed young. And that's one of the reasons how they got the name mystery snail. A lookalike, the brown mystery snail, which is a native, it has a little bit more of an olive green shell. Um, its width to height ratio is smaller than the Chinese or banded mystery snails, meaning it is less um, squat and more of, of a tall um, columnar um, sort of uh, shape than the two that we talked about in the earlier slide. Moving on to crayfish. Uh, we have a couple of um, aquatic invasive crayfish that we do find. Um, the rusty crayfish, quite, um, quite well known around the state, found in, in many of our counties, um, large up to five inches in size and gets its name from its uh, characteristic, uh, very distinct, the, the rusty brown spots on each side of its, of its hard shell. Um, the rusty crayfish came from Ohio River Basin, probably transported by anglers who had been using the crayfish for bait. Uh, besides its rusty brown spots, it also has black bands on its claw tips. It has very large claws in comparison to other species. Um, and the claws are smooth. If you look closely in that picture, you can see the, the smooth claws compared to the red swamp crayfish where you can see the dark red color, but also the raised bright red spots on the red swamp crayfish on the claws as well as its body. The red swamp crayfish originally is uh, from the Gulf Coast of Florida um, around to Mexico, originally not a native, but originally found in Florida around the Gulf Coast and over to Mexico. The red swamp crayfish can tolerate brackish water, which is somewhat unusual for crayfish. And also it can cross um, dry land, sometimes up to miles of dry ground and then burrow into the ground to um, sustain itself during dry periods. Definitely looking for those bright red spots covering the body and then also occasionally a black wedge shaped stripe on the top of the abdomen. Our lookalike native crayfish is the White River crayfish. Again, a dark red body, um, but um, 
can be brown with modeling, long narrow claws and a really interesting and, and distinct piece or um, part of the identification of the White River crayfish is that when the claws are closed, they fit completely um, tightly together. So there's no space between them. It almost looks like um, one, um, one complete claw rather than two separate ones. Going on to a couple of muscles, um, the zebra mussel and the quagga mussel. Um, zebra mussels can be up to two inches in size, but usually they are under one inch in length. Um, in both cases, the mussels um, are small in themselves, but they form clusters or clumps that cause issues for boating, swimming, fishing, and especially industrial water pipes, um, intake pipes, um, rigging and, and uh, anything that's in the water that they can cluster around. They cause um, billions of dollars of um, economic impact in those types of cases, especially in industrial water pipes. The zebra mussel is flat and symmetrical. It has a much more D shape rather than the rounded or fan shape of the quagga mussel. You can see them um, having the the yellowish or brownish shells in the picture, and then the alternating light and dark stripes, giving them their name, the zebra mussel. The quagga mussel, again, the fan shape, um, the two halves are asymmetrical, and the really narrow brown concentric stripes are, are pretty distinct on the, the quagga mussel. Um, the zebra mussel is a bottom dwelling clam native to Europe and Asia. It was introduced in the Great Lakes in the 19th 80s, 85 and 86, most likely in ballast water in ships. Currently found, this is the zebra mussel, currently found in nearly 300 lakes in, um, and rivers, lakes and rivers in Wisconsin. Uh, the quagga mussel also coming from the Great Lakes, found in Lake Erie in 89, and now well established in all of the lower Great Lakes as well as the surrounding rivers. Again, um, the quagga mussel even more so than others is, um, that extreme feeder eating up food sources of, of fish and drastically changing ecosystems. One other interesting fact, the ventral side or the bottom of the quagga mussel uh, where the two shells, two halves of the shell come together, um, it is convex, which makes it topple over if you were to try to stand it up um, on a flat surface compared to the zebra mussel, which you could actually stand up on a flat surface and it would remain upright. The Asian clam, um, we say it has ridges, it has raised concentric rings on the shell, and that is um, a really distinct piece that makes it much more easy to identify. So if you hold the, the clam and you run your thumbnail over it, you can actually feel the raised concentric rings of that clam. It is small, light in color, um, also has um, a blue inside color, which makes it distinct as well. Um, voracious feeders, the Asian clams are out competing other mussels and juvenile fish. Um, like zebra mussels, excuse me, yeah, the like zebra mus mussels and quagga mussels, the Asian clam forms those clusters and can have large economic impact on our um, water plants and other industrial water pipes by clogging the pipes. And then we have a native lookalike, the fingernail clams. Um, again, um, small, think about the, the size of a thumbnail, maybe up to an inch, uh, but really no, usually no larger than three quarters of an inch. So think about the size of your, your fingernail or your thumbnail. Um, a very um, fine concentric ring pattern. And if you look at the, the hinge uh, where you can see distinct teeth, on the Asian clam, you do not see that on the fingernail clam. A very smooth outer surface as compared to those concentric rings that I mentioned on the Asian clam. And lastly, let's wrap up with the spiny water flea. Arrived in the US in the 1980s, discovered in Iron County, Wisconsin in 2003, in Bylas County in 2007, and in the Madison Chain of Lakes in 2009. So fairly new compared to some of the others that we've been talking about, um, other than probably New Zealand mud snail. 
small, very small, a quarter of an inch. Um, translucent, has a distinct long tail. It's actually a spine and also a distinct dark eye. Um, so they can easily go unnoticed individually, but again, they, they gather together in masses on fishing lines and boat anchor ropes. And that's where we can see them more easily and they begin to really cause problems for us. So to wrap up, I just want to acknowledge the resources that I used in this presentation, um, some websites, DNR websites, a couple others there, and also the um, Wisconsin Aquatic Invasive Species Early Detector Handbook, which is a Citizen Lake Monitoring Network handbook um, that Paul has put together. So I wanna acknowledge that as well. Thank you. Thanks, Peggy. And at this point, we can switch over to our final speaker, um, Ann Pierce with the Wisconsin First Detector Network. Go ahead, Ann. Great. Good morning, everybody. So we're going to... Ann, I'm going to um, interrupt you real quick because we're seeing your um, presentation screen. Yep, I see that. Yep. Let's see. Is that better? For me, it's looking a little off scale. I don't know how it looks to others. Yeah, I see about half the slide. It's cutting, it's showing just the left half. Oh, that, that looks, looks good. Fine. Okay, well, we'll just stick with this and then hopefully somebody will let me know if, <laughs> if it looks funny again. You're good um, right now. Perfect, thanks Joe and Paul. So we're gonna move back to plants now and uh, start moving kind of towards the shoreline and up out of the water for the rest of the session today. Um, so I'm going to go through, uh, similar to Paul, a handful of plants, some of which are pretty common in Wisconsin, some of which are new higher priority species. Um, on each of my slides in the upper right hand corner, you'll see a map that shows whether that species is restricted. Um, so orange map and the letter R in the state of Wisconsin or whether it's prohibited. So our restricted species are those that are fairly widespread already. Um, we certainly would love to hear about it if you have them, um, but the prohibited species uh, which there will be a, a few of those are high priority species. If you think you found them or know you found them, um, it's definitely great for you to send in a report um, to your local aquatic invasive species coordinator or really any one of us that, that are presenting here today. So we're gonna start with flowering rush. Um, as the name suggests, it's a rush that flowers. So it's most easily identified when it's in bloom from about June through August, um, you'll see these pinkish whitish flowers um, and three-sided leaf, leaf stems. Um, if you're looking for kind of other characteristics to confirm this plant, or maybe it's not flowering, maybe you wanna double check, you'll see at the root of the plant, uh, there's these kind of onion shaped bulbs that form on the roots as well. And you can see from the distribution map, this has been kind of found in scattered locations across Wisconsin. And this is one that um, you'll definitely see in the water, it can grow either as an emergent plant or submergent. If it's completely submerged under the water, you won't see it flowering. There's a few groups of species that might get confused with the flowering brush. So our burr reed species and bulrush species um, sometimes can also have that three-sided stem. If you take a look at these pictures when they're flowering though, these, these other groups of species have these very spiky, flower heads much different from the kind of pinkish, whitish petals that you see on the flowering rush. Next up is yellow iris. Um, this is pretty easy to identify when it's in flower, those bright yellow flowers. Another plant that's restricted and we've got reports of it kind of across the state. Um, this one blooms fairly early in the year, so take a look at your shorelines starting in about April down here in southern Wisconsin where I am, uh, maybe a little bit later up north as your ice goes out. The flower stalks on this one can grow up to four feet tall, so they can get pretty tall. And they've got broad sword-shaped leaves. So when they're not flowering, um, there are several species that they might get confused with, including the native blue flag iris, which is gonna be its closest lookalike, but obviously the blue flag has a more purplish flower color and then our cattail species and our sweet flag species. Um, so again, easiest to identify this one when it is flowering early in the spring and summer. 
Speaking of cattails, um, we have both native and invasive cattails here in Wisconsin. And generally the way to differentiate them is to look at the male and female flowers. And so on our cattails, the male flowers are kind of on the top of the stalk and the female flowers are kind of that sausage shaped uh, structure on the cattails. And with our native cattails, generally there's no gap between the male and female flowers. On our non-native cattails, of which we have a handful of species, there's typically a gap between the male and female flowers. Now we're seeing from some genetic analysis that this is, isn't always true, um, but for most of us, it's kind of a good rule of thumb. And today we're gonna just focus on one of our invasive cattail species, the graceful cattail, which as you can see in the upper right corner is a prohibited species. So this is one that if you think you have found it, we definitely want a report of it. So far, it's only been found in a handful of places in southeastern Wisconsin. But generally, this is just a very compact, tiny cattail compared to most of the cattails that we're familiar with. So I really want you to take a look at um, the picture on the right and compare the size of that flower structure to that person's hand, uh, just to notice how compact that is. And this one, you'll see that gap between the male flowers on top and the female flowers below. And that gap can actually be pretty large, up to two inches. So, so if you see what is a seemingly tiny cattail, I definitely let someone know. Moving on to a species that probably most people are familiar with by now, we'll take a look at purple loosestrife. So this is a wetland plant that you know loves to have its feet wet, but we also see it a lot on our roadsides in those wet ditches. So it's a perennial herbaceous plant, but as it gets older, the stems can feel pretty woody. Um, if you get a close look at this plant and can feel it, the stems are ridged, they have four to six sides, so you can feel those ridges on the stems. And then they have opposite leaves, as you can see in the picture on the bottom. Um, sometimes there will be a whorl of leaves originating from that same point on the stem as well. And this one starts blooming kind of later in the summer, July into September, and you're gonna be looking for these dense spikes of kind of magenta colored flowers that typically have five to seven petals each. Purple loosestrife also has several uh, native lookalike species. Here are just a few. I would say, especially for those of you in Northern Wisconsin, fireweed is likely to be the one that's most easily confused with purple loosestrife. Um, I like to botanize while I'm driving down the highway. And I think later in the summer, I have to do a double take to check and see if that pinkish plant in the ditch is loosestrife or fireweed. Um, fireweed has a similar structure and the, the flowers are a similar size, but each individual flower is a similar size to purple loosestrife, but you'll see that that flower cluster is a much looser, more open structure. And then these other species can get confused with loosestrife. Um, Blue vervain has those spikes of flowers, but the individual flowers are very tiny and the color of the flowers is more purplish or blue um, compared to the more magenta color of purple loosestrife. And there's some of our blazing stars that have a similar color, but I mean, these fringy petal structures on the blazing star are much, much different from purple loosestrife. Um, up next is lesser celandine. This is another prohibited species, so one that we definitely want to hear about if you think you found it. It's a spring ephemeral plant, so it blooms, uh, starts coming out pretty much as soon as the snow melts. So pay attention to, you know, as your shorelines start uh, getting uncovered from snow and ice, start looking around for this plant. It's a ground cover, so it doesn't grow very tall. And you're gonna be looking for kidney shaped leaves that are glossy and dark green. And sometimes they're kind of scalloped around the edges as you can see in the picture at the top that has uh, several flowers in it. The edges aren't always scalloped like that though. But the flowers, um, bright yellow, kind of that buttercup color. And each flower stalk is only gonna have a single flower on it. And then at the base of the flower, if you look at the picture on the lower left, there's three green sepals below the flower. So that's one characteristic you can look for to differentiate this from other species. Um, and then the other things you're gonna look for on lesser celandine are in this middle picture, bulbils which are these kind of whitish spherical structures, their reproductive structure that's produced on the stems of the plants. 
and then tubers, so kind of those potato-like structures on the roots. And the bulbils and tubers are both reproductive structures. Um, so even though this is a spring ephemeral and the leafy green part of this plant will die back certainly by June, these reproductive structures allow it to keep spreading um, and get carried away in the water throughout the season. So this is a pretty big concern along our riparian areas. We do have um, our native lookalike, the marsh marigold. So another spring ephemeral that I know lots of us look forward to seeing each spring. It's got similar colored, bright yellow flowers, grows in similar areas, blooms at the same time. So what you're gonna look for to differentiate the uh, salandine from marigolds, but the marsh marigolds is generally a larger plant and each flower stalk typically has two to five flowers on it instead of the single flower that we'll see on lesser salandine. The marsh marigold doesn't have those green sepals. So if you turn over the flower head, you won't see the green sepals below. And then it also does not have those bulbils or tubers. So those reproductive structures. And you have about four minutes with this session. Okay. Um, up next is butterfly box. So this is, we found this um, in a couple of new places this year. Basically, if you see something that looks like giant rhubarb leaves growing in a wet area with the big flower stalk coming out of it, a uh, good idea to let somebody know. The flowers do emerge before the leaves in the spring, but as you can see on the right side uh, photo, the flower heads with the seeds will remain standing uh, when the leaves arrive as well. Uh, we also have our knotweeds. There's three knotweed species in Wisconsin. This is another one that's probably pretty familiar to people. Um, grows definitely along riparian areas, but kind of getting into that more upland area as well. We look for big arching plants with smooth stems that are hollow and these uh, alternate spade shaped leaves. And then it's easiest to spot late in the summer when it has the plumes of tiny white flowers kind of popping up from the stems. And just to mention that we do have the three species. So Japanese knotweed is the smallest, giant knotweed is the largest, and then Bohemian knotweed is a hybrid of the two. So it's kind of got in-between characteristics, but they all generally look the same. Um, and it's a good idea to kind of map where any of these are. It doesn't really matter what species, they're all managed the same. Up next is another species that's pretty new to the state. It's called um, golden creeper, or it's also known as red hailstone, uh, based on the fruit that it produces, which there's a picture of that in the lower right corner. This is a member of the cucumber family, uh, but it's a perennial vine that has lots of tubers that it grows from. Um, and that picture on the bottom kind of center, you can see a riparian area that's just been overtaken by golden creeper because the tubers tend to spread in flooding events. So this one, you're gonna look for hairy heart-shaped leaves that kind of have that rough texture of cucumber leaves. And then it blooms throughout the summer, kind of July into September with numerous one inch yellow flowers. Now, uh, golden creeper does have separate male and female plants. And to this point, we've only seen male plants in Wisconsin. So we don't expect that people would see these red fruits because those would only be on the female plants. But definitely if you see a vine like this with lots of yellow flowers, particularly along roadsides or in riparian areas, we definitely want to know about it. All right, and then moving on to stilt grass. Um, this is a species that was found for the very first time in the state last year in La Crosse County. Um, it's a species that's very widespread in the Eastern United States. So we suspected it would pop up first in Southeastern Wisconsin, but Turns out we got fooled and it was in Western Wisconsin. Um, so this is one we suspect is in more locations than we realize at this point, but it's a pretty small annual grass with a really weak root system. Um, but the leaves on it are pretty distinct because they're, they're asymmetrical. So uh, one side of the leaf tends to be a bit more rounded and one side tends to be a bit more flat. And then if you look at the picture on the left, it has that kind of shiny silvery stripe down the middle of the leaf. And this one can grow up to three feet tall, but generally you see it kind of as a spreading mat along the ground uh, in moist forests or along riparian areas. So there are some lookalike species in Wisconsin. 
um, a few other grasses that it can get confused with. The white grass or Leusia species um, often grow right next to the stilt grass. Um, very similar growth habitat habit um, and habitats, but the white grass won't have that silvery rib or stripe down the middle of the leaf. Crabgrass, um, the flowering structure, kind of a three spikes of flowers, um, looks similar on crabgrass and stilt grass, but again, the crabgrass leaves uh, grow in much more dense clumps with stronger roots and they don't have that stripe. And then some of our smartweed species actually do kind of have a silvery stripe down the middle of the leaf, um, but they're not grasses. And so their veins aren't parallel uh, going straight up and down the leaf as you'll see on our grass species. And then the smartweeds tend to have kind of pinkish or whitish flowers. So if you see it in bloom, it'll be easy to tell it apart from the stilt grass. So that is it. Thanks so much, Anne, um, and to all of our speakers, Paul and Peggy. Um, we have used up the entire time um, for this session. So those of you who have been posting questions, you may have seen that um, Paul jumped in and started typing answers. And I believe he's answered every question you all posted into that Q&A box. So if you posted a question or just want to review them, pop over to the Q&A box and you'll be able to see the um, questions and the answers from Paul. And he's provided some links and, and some really good information there. Um, we are now entering a short break. The next presentations will begin at 10 a.m. Um, the next presentation in this session on aquatic invasive species will include Say It, Then Spray It, Challenges and Successes of Implementing a Countywide Watercraft Decontamination Ordinance, followed by 24 d Degradation in Lakes Following Whole Lake applications. Um, so during this uh, next 15 minute break, um, stretch your legs, move around, um, and consider visiting the exhibitor and sponsor booths in the virtual event space. Um, we'll reconvene here at 10 a.m. <laughs>